So welcome everyone also on YouTube and Moodle if you're watching this. Today we will be doing regression analysis and I'm really really excited about it because um, regressions, ANOVAs and these kind of things are kind of my specialty in a way. Um, it's where I did my PhD in so I, I'm quite familiar with how to do regression and I think a lot of you guys are actually really wondering when will the statistics start. Um, we already did a little bit of statistics right like t-test and non-parametric t-test but um, I think now we're starting to do regression right so now it becomes a little bit more serious in the statistical part um, and um, I will just go through um, let me see what do we have for today okay so yeah first off the exam will be on the 21st of July at 2 um, you can't register yet in Agnes, I think, because I got a mail from someone after the last lecture saying um, I looked into Agnes and it's not there yet. But that is because you can only register in Agnes two weeks before or four weeks before the exam. So four weeks before the exam means that on the 2nd of July, it should be possible to register. So if you've looked in Agnes and you haven't found the exam yet, um, then th this is the reason. The re-exam will be on the 9th of the 9th, again via Zoom Moodle, um, and the best grade will count. So for everyone who says, oh, I can't really study for the first exam, so I will do the re-exam, don't. Just do the exam, because if you do the exam, um, you can always do the re-exam to improve your score, um, and if you only do the re-exam, then of course, you only have one chance and having two chances is better than one chance. Um, so yeah, it will be online on Moodle, I hope, the 2nd of July and then you should all be able to register. Um, so yeah, I, I, will, I will keep track of it and people who can't register, just send me an email and then I will let you know how to register. So the assignments from last week, I, th I hope people were able to do it. So hands up in chat or just shout something in chat if you were able to. Um, I have registered for the exam yesterday. Oh, nice. So it, then it is already in Agnes. Okay, good. Then the guy who mailed me, um, I will mail him back to, to uh, make sure that he checks Agnes again. Because he checked Agnes last week and it wasn't there last week. Um, but good, good. That's very, very good news. Thank you for telling me. Perfect. Um, so... Yeah, shout out in chat if you were able to make a package. So did you build your first R package and um, were successful or didn't because of some error? Um, I'm really curious to see how it went. My name is Mousy. You're also not a VIP. What, what the hell is happening? Why are people that are here like week after week not VIPs? Um, so, but you were able to build uh, a package. That is very good. I like your name, by the way. My name is Mousy. There you go. And you are also a VIP. So you got your little diamond. Um, good. So two people were able to build the package. Uh, I know Daniel tried as well and failed halfway through and asked me some questions, um, like via email. Are you here, Daniel? You, you told me you should be here, so... Shout out in chat for Daniel. Where are you? <laughs> like, you're finished with your work, right? So you should be able to attend the lectures now. Um, but I can show you guys, like, how I made my package, but I made it exactly the same way as, um, as I told you during the lecture. So um, I, can, I can show you. So let me open up the correct files. So it is docx. Then we go to our course and then we have your package name. Um, so first off, the description file. So this is the description file that I used, um, more or less very similar to the uh, description file that I showed you during the, uh, during the lecture. Um, so it, it just tells you or it tells R what you need to run this package, right? So the, it gives a name, a version, when it was created, a title, the author, the maintainer, you need R and at least version 3.0. It has a description and a license. And of course, it doesn't have to be in this order, 
So you can change the order around if you want to, um, and that should all be perfectly fine. Um, then there is a namespace file, um, which of course um, initially used to be empty, but during the lecture I told you that if you want to give a function to the user, um, then you should export it. So my package is exporting two functions, one which is called my first package function, um, just like in the lecture, and then export the call test C from R, um, which is the example which I showed you guys on how to call C or C++ code. Um, and of course, since we are using C code, which gets compiled, um, we have to load the dynamic library. So we have to load the compiled code first, and that is also done using the namespace file. So this loads the compiled DLL under Windows or the SO file when you're under Linux, and then we export two functions. Um, I can show you the functions that I wrote. So I have one file which is called my first package function dot R, um, which looks like this. Um, I also made an internal function I see now, just so that I have an internal function to annotate. Um, and I, I just made a function which does nothing. And of course this one just prints something to the screen. Um, but this one is not exported to the user, so the user cannot call it. Um, or gets an error when they try to call it and it says that no such function is found. There are some ways that you can still call it. Um, and then we have the call, uh, call C from R test file and this is again the same file as that I showed you during the, uh, during the lecture. Um, we have some manual files of course, um, so we have the call C test from R, so again very similar to what I showed you. Um, and of course we have the my first package function um, like this. Um, and had this is kind of the minimal amount of things that you need to mention. Had, so you need to mention the name, the alias, the title. You have to give a description, even though the description can be like very short. Um, you can have a usage section, arguments, details, values, and examples. Um, and then the keywords have to be method. Um, so I'm hoping that everyone was able to build it um, because kind of these are the four minimal files that you need to build a package for R. Uh, and like I said, like building or being able to build a package in R is very useful um, because there's only a limited amount of people who can program R and from the people who can program R there's only a limited amount of people who can actually build a package. So being able to build a package for other people when they ask you um, has so if you if people know that you can program in R, um, then hey, you can tell them, oh, but I can also build a package. Um, and then in the future, when they have some nice code that they wrote to do an analysis, then you can help them build their own package. Um, and this will, it, is it, it's a nice way to get co-authorships on publications. Um, just by contributing your skills as a packager, um, you can get some nice publications or some co-authorships. Hey, you won't be first author, of course. All right, so kind of that's everything that I wanted to say about how to build a package. So you need, and like you need a description file, a namespace file, you need some R files where there's some code and you need some manual files uh, to describe what code you are going to give to the user. Um, and then if you did everything correctly and you put everything in the right folders, um, then if you do an RCMD check, it should just run through it without any issues. Um, and you might get one or two notes about like minor things. Um, but if everything went correctly, then yeah, that, that's how you do it. So if there's no other questions about package building, then I think we should just start with um, the lecture. I'll wait a little bit so that people can ask questions in chat. Um, but uh, I hope that everyone was able to build their own first package. I think it's a nice uh, halfway point, right? Because we're like last week, we were halfway through the lectures. Um, and a halfway point is really nice that you are at a point where you can write your own code or write your own little functions and have the ability to kind of give this code to other people um, and have, of course there's much more to it right if you want to get your uh, package on cran head then you have to follow their system so you have to submit an email first saying that I want to upload a package with this name then they send you back a link and then on that link you have to upload your package um, but that is all quite straightforward it's just following the kind of manual line 
All right, I see nothing in chat, so everyone was able to build their package, which is really, really good, and I'm really, really happy about that. So um, there will be some questions about package building on the exam. All right, so for today, regression analysis, um, I have a, a, an overview. So what will we be doing or what will we be discussing today? So we will be discussing basic regression. Um, so first we will start with single linear regression um, and talk about things like confidence intervals and how to plot confidence intervals and residuals and these kinds of things. Um, besides that, I wanted to talk to you guys about multiple linear regression, which is actually my kind of my PhD study field. Um, and then I wanted to say a few words about quadratic regression um, because it fits really nicely into the data set that we will be analyzing. And then a few words about model selection and how can you how can you compare different models that you have, right? So you have a phenomenon, um, for example, precipitation that you measured and besides that you have all kinds of variables which are predictors for the precipitation for example are there clouds um, what's the temperature what's the air humidity and then eh, all of these things you combine into a single model but of course you can combine them in many many different ways and you want to have a kind of uh, a way to decide this model is better than the other models um, and that also means that there's one slide in Latin for me today. So that's a slide that I'm going to give you for free. So you can listen to my beautiful Latin, Latin speaking. Um, and I'm, I'm curious to see how it will work out. I, I officially had Latin in high school, but um, since it's a dead language, no one knows how it's spoken. So it, sh it should be fine. No matter how you pronounce it, it's always correct, right? Um, so these are the topics for today. Um, but I want you to ask questions, right? Um, like on this slide, it is an introduction for you guys on how to use the LM function and how to use the ANOVA function and some of the helper functions around it. Um, but like I said, I have a lot of experience in linear modeling, um, but I try to keep kind of the lecture short. Latin died, my condolences. Well, yeah, the only one who speaks it is the Pope, right? And he's the authority on it. And um, yeah, officially there's no no way we, we don't have any recordings of people speaking latin in the old days so um but that, like today we will have a very short um lecture it's like 41 slides so i'm hoping to fill at least one and a half hours with it um but if you ask questions we can have a much longer um discussion today um like i'm here for you guys until five um so hey ask unrelated questions if you want more details um, so today we will do basic linear modeling but don't worry next week we will be talking about linear mixed models and a week after we will be talking about generalized linear mixed models so hey, because it's a massive field linear models um, so i made a little bit of an overview slide for you guys um, so this is more or less everything, right? So here we have uh, what we are going to talk about today. So today we are going to talk about linear regression, um, about ANOVA and about multiple linear regression. Um, the analysis of covariance, I will kind of skip over because it's very similar to the analysis of variance. Um, and these are called general linear models. So that will be the topic for today. Um, and they, they are really nice. Um, but they have very severe limitations. So um, things like repeated measurements cannot be handled by standard general linear models. So next week we will be talking about when you have repeated measurements or when you have time series data and how to use mixed models to kind of analyze uh, these kind of structures uh, where there's um, structure between the individual measurements that you have. But for today we will be only be talking about when you have randomly measured things from a population and you want to calculate things which are valid for the whole population while and you can do the same thing of course with mixed or linear mixed models um, but the linear mixed models allow you to kind of optimize your p or well optimize your p-value sounds a little bit like p-hacking um, but it allows you to deal with things like repeated measurements um, uh, things like random effects um, where, for example, certain individuals have a or share a father or they share a mother, um, how to deal with those. Um, and then the week after we will be talking about generalized linear models and we will be talking about things like logistic regression, um, binomial and log linear models. So in the case 
that the input variable that you have is not a, um, a kind of a continuous variable. So when it is, uh, for example, a yes, no answer or uh, when you have very specific amount of levels or if you have a very, very weird um, phenotype structure or a, a very weird measurement structure that you have. Um, but for today, uh, general linear models. So very basic, very short introduction and um, ask as much questions as you want. I can talk about this shit for like hours and hours on end, um, which I actually do during my work. Um, but since it's a lecture and I don't want to overload you guys with all kinds of like little details, um, I try to keep it kind of high level. But if you're interested and think like, oh, but have the data that I have has this kind of a, a quirk to it. How do I deal with it? Then just let me know, right? Because then we can, I can just make an example in R and we can just talk about it. And since I only have a limited amount of slides, we have enough time to, uh, to deal with your questions. All right, so very basically regression analysis is the statistical process for estimating or kind of finding relationships among several variables that you have. And there are many techniques for analyzing these several variable models, but the focus is on the relationship between the dependent variables and one or more independent variables. So just terminology speaking, the dependent variable is the output or the effect. Um, so the thing that you have measured and want to explain and the independent variables are things like the input or the cause. And those are the things to which you want to distribute the variance to, right? So in my mind, um, in, there is variance in the dependent variable. Right, so you did like a hundred measurements of a certain thing, and now based on other variables, you want to distribute the variance that you see in the dependent variable onto the independent variables to kind of assign variance. So it's kind of a assign the blame game, right? Because you want to say, well, um, this genetic marker is responsible for a change in this gene's expression, and and not only is this genetic marker responsible for it, but there's also some environmental influence on it, right? So you are trying to take all of the variance that is in your dependent variable and assign this variance somewhere. So the basic regression model looks like this. So the basic regression model is like Y, which is our dependent variable, right? The response. And that is then predicted by a function. And in this function, we have our independent variables. And these independent variables are then coupled to something called beta. And beta is the regression coefficient for x. So if you have five independent variables, then you will have five beta values. Right, so there are some constants which are not mentioned in this model, but hey, you have n, which is the number of independent measurement. So that is the length of your of your vector y, so of your dependent variable. Right, so I might have measured a hundred cows, or hey, I might have measured milk yield from a hundred cows. So then n is a hundred, and then k is the number of unknown parameters. So that is the number of kind of independent variables, right? So I can have, I, I have measured milk yield in cows. And now I, for example, have five other measurements like the body weight, the length of the tail, the, does it have horns, um, other measurements. And, and I want to assign the variance in the milk yield to these different independent variables. I hope that's clear. So here we have beta, which is the thing that we are going to compute. Then we have x, which is a matrix more or less. If you have only one, then of course it's just a vector, but x tends to be a matrix of different things. Um, and then we have y, uh, which is the dependent variable. And that is the thing that we are trying to predict, the thing that we are putting our variance um, I, the, where we are taking the variance and distributing it across the different vectors of X. All right, so regression comes with a lot of assumptions. And I kind of want you guys to know all of them, right? Because if any of these assumptions do not hold, then your regression model is not valid. Um, but of course, there are some which are more 
more important than the other one. So I highlighted in red the things which often go wrong and the things that are really important for a valid regression model. So the first assumption is, is that the sample is representative of the populations for the inference prediction. Right? That means that if I want to make a statement in the end, right? so I, I, I do my modeling and in the end I want to make a statement like um, humans who have this gene tend to be bigger. Right? Then I have to have randomly sampled from the human population. That means that just doing the study in Germany is not good enough because humans is much broader than just Germany. Right? There's people from Africa as well, and there's people from Asia, and there's people from America, and they are not German. And this is one of the things which is, like in science, goes wrong most of the time. Right? So people draw conclusions and make it seem like these conclusions are valid for all cows on the planet or all humans on the planet. But then when you look at how they sampled, they did not randomly sample across the planet. They only sampled Eastern Europe or they only sampled Western Europe or they sampled a very small area. So the sample that you are taking has to be representative of the population that you are going to do the inference on. And this is the thing that goes wrong the most in science. And in many, many scientific papers, really nicely written papers, very good data, relatively good results, but then they, their conclusions are way too broad. And this is because of the first assumption underlying linear regression or underlying um, ANOVA analysis. The second one is very important, and that is that the error, right? So the error is the thing which remains, right? So if I have like my, um, my variance in the thing that I want to predict, and I've assigned variance to all the different things that I have used to kind of catch this variance, then in the end, I'm always left with some kind of error. Because, of course, no measurement is perfect, no measurement machine is perfect. However, the errors in uh, the error is a random variable with a mean of zero conditional on the explanatory variables. So that means that if I want to rephrase it, it just says that if I look at my model, and I take my, my phenotype of interest and I fit it all the different things that I am interested in or want to look at what the effect of this is on the, on the phenotype that I measured, then I'm left with, an, with a, 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 an additional term. And this is my error term, also called the residuals of the model. And the residuals need to have a mean of zero conditional on the explanatory variables. So of course the residuals don't have to be normally dis uh, they have to be normally distributed with a mean of zero. And that's kind of the idea behind it. The independent variables are measured with no error. Also this goes wrong a lot of the times, but it is not that important because a little bit of error never hurt anyone. And that's kind of what I think, but the independent variables normally should not be measured with error. Um, so, for example, if one of my predictors is the sex of the animal that we're analyzing, right, then of course I cannot make mistakes there. I cannot say this is a male while it's actually a female, and I cannot say this is a female while it's actually a male, right? So, so I have to be very careful when I define my independent variables, because these independent variables, the, the model is much better when you have no error in these measurements. Of course, errors always occur. So you, you can't guarantee that there are no errors, but this is one of the assumptions underlying the, uh, the regression model is that there, there are at least a minimal amount of errors. Then one of the things that often goes wrong as well is that the predictors are linearly independent. It is not possible to express any predictor as a linear combination of the others. And this is called collinearity. Um, yeah, so that two things are collinear, and this is something that is really hard to avoid and generally almost impossible to avoid. There will always be some linear dependency. Um, the question is just how much is there? And um, we can we can 
go back to this later. But this is one of these things that is really important and which is something that you can actually check by just building your model and then taking your independent variables and start switching them around. Because if you if you have like three independent explanatory variables, right, and you have several p-values for them or several beta coefficients, when you start moving them around and the beta coefficients start like changing by a lot, um, then of course then that means, hey Florian, welcome to the lecture. Um, if you start changing them around a lot, um, then the, the problem becomes that you cannot assign the variance because then you cannot uniquely say um, well, being clouded has a certain effect on the raininess because the, the cloudiness is coupled to the temperature. Um, errors are uncorrelated, which means that the errors cannot be correlated to any of your predictor variables. Generally, people don't even test this, um, but it is one of these assumptions that is there. And then the last one, which is very important, but a lot of times overlooked because the word is just too hard to pronounce is that the variance of your data should be approximately equal across the range of your predicted uh, values and this is called homoscledasticity or absence of heteroscledasticity I'm not even going to say it. Um, if this is not the case, um, log transform or other methods might be used instead. Right? So, but this just means um, Let's just make a little graph of that, right? Um, I have my board here, so why not just use it once in a while? Like, I haven't really used it in a long time, so I don't think we ever used it yet. So let's go to full screen, and I will draw a nice... Oh, that's, that's strange. That's not how this should be. Um, filter, crop pad, just delete that. Yes, and I'm big. Very good. So then you finally can see the rest. Like you can see my, my bottle collection. Like that that's my pension fund right there. Um, I'm in Germany, so you get money for bringing back bottles. All right, so um, homoscledosity or heteroscledosity. Uh, let's remove the attack of the lockdown as well. Um, and just like make a little graph, right? So linear regression like looks like this a little bit. So on one side, we have our independent variable in deep and here we have our dependent variable right and now what we want to see when we do something like this is that there is a relationship so imagine that my independent variable so that the thing that I measured has five levels right for example um, human height let's say that we divide human height in like five groups right so we have people who are uh, less than 140 um, then we have people who are 140 to 150 centimeters, um, 150 to 160, and so on, right? And then you have people who are larger than like two meters. Now, if we have our dependent variable, for example, the body weight, then of course the first group has a certain variance, right? So we have some measurement points, and then we have more measurement points here as well. We have more measurement points here. So that's three groups, then we have four groups. And then now we have five groups, right? So the the, the heteroscladicity. Do you use R Studio? Um, well, for the lectures we generally use R standard, so the R GUI. But I have used R Studio in the past. It's just R, right? It doesn't really matter um, which you use. Um, but heteroscladicity, or it's such a bad word, uh, or homoscladicity, is the fact that when you fit your model, right, because we are going to fit the best fitting line, so we want to do a regression line, but the thing that we don't want to see is that the variance in the first group is much smaller than the variance in the last group, right? So if the measurements here go all the way like this, right, in the last group, then now the variance here is much, much bigger than in the first group. And this means that now your model is not valid if you see a pattern like this um, and this is something that people rarely check they rarely check for heteroscladicity and there are ways to solve this hey, but generally you have the standard that hey, the bigger your measurements become also the bigger the variance becomes but this means just that the line the regression line cannot be estimated very correctly because in this case hey, a regression line like this would also fit quite well and a regression line like this would also very well and that is because the the, the points that are here at the outside of the distribution have a much larger influence on our regression line than the points here 
right? So points here are much closer to the regression line, so they don't really influence the regression line that much. But in a heteros heteroskeletal situation, it ends up that these points here, because of the variance being much bigger in this group, and this is very, very detrimental to when you are doing a regression model. And this kind of invalidates all of the predictions, because when I'm now starting to predict things for people who are larger than three meters, and then of course you can see that these lines are kind of going very broad, so um, it is, it is um, very big. You see this in fermentation experiments when you measure the OD600 of cells. The error from the OD measurements affect the reading at a lower value compared to a larger value. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's, that's true. You see this in a, in a bunch of measurements. And it's actually like every kind of um, measuring machine uh, suffers from this, right? Because you have a certain dynamic range, um, but large numbers tend to be associated with larger variance. Um, so it's not something that will completely invalidate your regression model. It's just something to be aware of that this is happening. And Florian is pressing buttons again. Florian, I can't do the next slide in three different languages. Like, pick one. Which one do you want? Dutch or German? And you're not getting your points back for the other one. Like, you were dumb enough to click the button. Both. So, how, how <laughs> Flemish? <laughs> no, I'm not going to do it in Flemish. Like, I, I have certain standards here. Like, uh, all right, let's get back to the lecture. Um, and let's move myself in out of the way. So, face cam. All right, uh, that's better, right? So, you guys can see me again. All right, so these, these are the assumptions for linear regression. Right? So, there's a lot of assumptions, and we generally need to check them all. The ones in red are the ones which often go wrong. So if you ever need to do a journal club um, and you have a paper where they use linear regression, make sure that you check these assumptions. And the first one is the most important one because this is what very, very often goes wrong in, in research. That people make conclusions which are overly broad, right? They only measured people in a very like narrow area of the population and now they try to generalize their results to everyone, right? Which is often what you see. Um, which is also probably the major issue with phase three trials for medicine, which is usually done in like one country or like two or three countries. Um, and then they conclude, well, the vaccine is safe for everyone on the planet, which actually, um, is it right you can lock? Yeah, yeah. So it also says here, right? So the last part, the, the homoscleidacity, you can log transform to get rid of this effect. Um, there are other ways uh, that you can use it to kind of um, minimize the effect of these like extreme points on your regression line. But log transformation is one of the most common methods. Um, but there are other ones, like you can use square root transformations as well. Um, and there are some other transformations which also affect kind of the, the higher range much more than the lower range. So, um, but, and you can have it the other way around as well, right? You could have a large variance in this group and a small variance here, which means that you're unable to predict down, but you're actually pretty able to predict up. Um, but that really depends on your measurement machine and where the error is. But making a plot like this is always, always good to kind of check if your data is valid. All right, so those are the assumptions. Okay. Ik ga deze in het Nederlands doen voor Florian. Zo, so Florian, hier gaan we. Wanneer n groter is dan k, en de, dit gaat terug naar de slide hier, waar we, he, n is de, het aantal onafhankelijke metingen, en k is de hoeveelheid um, onbekende parameters die we willen schatten, dus de, de, de hoeveelheid beta's. Wanneer je meer metingen hebt dan onafhankelijke variabelen, en de gemeten error is normaal gedistributed, dus is een is Gaussian uh, distributie, uh, dan spreken we dat er een excess van informatie is. Dus een, een overvloed aan informatie. Hè, en, dit, en, en dit kun je berekenen door gewoon te zeggen van nou, we hebben 100 metingen en we hebben 5 beta's die we willen schatten. Hè, en als we die van elkaar aftrekken, dan hebben we dus 95 vrijheidsgraden min of meer. Hè, het is niet precies vrijheidsgraden, maar als we... Uh, als de assumptie is dat alles lineair is, hè, dus dat we gewoon niet groepen hebben, maar dat we gewoon een, een stijgend lineair effect hebben, hè, dan kunnen we dus um, de, de, de overvloed van informatie gebruiken om statistische voorspellingen te maken over de 
onbekende parameter. Good. So that was it in Dutch, and I will read it now in English. So the n, right, which goes back to n and k, so the number of independent measurements that I have related to the number of parameters that I want to estimate, had the difference between these two is the amount of excess information. And the excess of information is kind of expressed as n minus k. Of course, this assumes that you are looking at a linear relationship and not at a grouping relationship like I did here. And so if the if the independent variable is just a, a linear or is it's just a continuous variable and your dependent variable is also a uh, is also kind of a continuous variable then every um, every k measurement so every beta that you estimate takes away one degree of freedom. So when I have a hundred measurements and I'm trying to estimate five independent variables then I have 95 degrees of freedom and the more degrees of freedom I have the more certainty I have or the more statistical power I have to make predictions about the beta parameters that I'm trying to estimate so about the unknown parameters and that is where the power of regression comes from this also means that when I'm trying to estimate too many unknown parameters with a very limited amount of measurements, right? If I have only 20 measurements, of course, I cannot estimate 30 different parameters because then hey, 20 minus 30 is minus 10, which means that I actually, actually have a lack of information. So I don't have enough measurements to make any statistical uh, or to say anything statistically valid about my unknown parameter, so about my independent variables. All right, linear regression in R is done via the LM function. So I'm here using the air quality data set, which we already saw during the plotting lecture. So just for you guys to remind you, um, the air quality data set has um, ozone, temperature, I think wind speed, and what's the last one? Because it has another one. Um, data air quality. Let me let me actually just load it. And then the data set is called air quality, of course. Um, solar radiation. That's the last one. So it has the ozone concentration, solar radiation, the wind speed, the temperature, and then the month and the day at which it was measured. So very basically, if I want to predict the ozone temperature like I'm oh, like I'm going to do here right so I'm saying that the ozone in the air is predicted by the temperature so ozone is my dependent variable temperature is my independent variable of course you can directly see that one of the assumptions is broken in this model and if anyone can tell me which one of these uh, which assumption is broken in this model you will have my like eternal gratitude or well not gratitude like I will be very very proud of you guys so and just very basically think about the air quality data set right so and it has a couple of different measurements um, we can make the model by just saying linear model take ozone as our dependent variable temperature is our independent variable and then say data is air quality and then we just store this model. If we want to see what's in the model, then we just do the summary function for the model and then here we throw in the model. So um, let's go back to the assumptions. So which assumption is broken? So there's 16 people viewing, so at least one of them should be able to do a guess. Um, and there's no wrong answers. Like you won't get points subtracted on the exam when you don't know the answer like it's just something like hey if you just think about how it is hey, which ones of these um, might not be valid for the current model when we say that the ozone is dependent on the temperature go 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 no one come on people is it number one? Is it number two? Is it number three? Is it number four? Number five or number six? New? No one? Uh, 
number one, maybe number four. Okay, there, there come the guesses. All right, so the, the number one, there is something to say, but the problem is, is that for this data set, we cannot know uh, what we are doing an inference for. Number four, the predictors are linearly independent. Uh, we only have one predictor. And if we have one predictor, the predictor is always linear independent, right? Because there's no no one to be. No, the, the, the issue here is number three. You cannot measure temperature without any error. That means that like the temperature can be 45.3337211873. But no matter how you write down your temperature, you're always wrong because there's always one more digit behind the comma that you could have measured that you didn't do. So there's always a little bit of an error. Right? So the independent variables are measured with no error, but that's impossible because you cannot measure temperature without an error. You can measure sex without an error, but temperature, no. Because you can say, well, it's 43 degrees, but it could be 39.98, and then there's 0 0.02 error in your measurement. So no matter where you put the digits, no matter how many digits you write, it's a small error, right? And that's why, I'm, why I highlighted this one in black. Because this is, of course, almost impossible. Because there are no machines that do not have any error in measurement. Even a basic thing like a thermometer has a little bit of error. So the assumption which is broken is assumption number three, no error in the model. Of course, the linear independence doesn't come into play here because we only have one independent variable and it cannot be linearly dependent on any of the other ones. Um, but uh, it's good that you think about it, right? Um, Alexander, or Alexander uh, is there assumption for error in model? Um, well, yeah, the assumption for the error Right, the error term in our model here, yeah, where we do kind. Of, if you would write this down on a board, right, and you would you would want to publish your model here, um, then the model that you're doing is looking something like this. Um, so, yeah, you would write down. Is this visible, by the way? If I just do it here, so you would write down something like ozone is predicted by the temperature plus an error. Right, so ozone I, J is temperature on I, error on J. Right, this is the way that you would write down your linear model in a paper. So the, the error term here, which you always hide or almost never mention, right, those are the residuals. So when I, when I regressed ozone on temperature, then there is, of course, variance left. And this variance here goes into the error term. And then when I look at the error term, then when I plot the error term, it look, should look like a normal distribution with a mean of around zero. But if we look at the summary from this model, very basic model, we say that the ozone concentration in the air is dependent on the temperature that we measure. So, and of course it doesn't fulfill all the assumptions, but that's okay. You can never fulfill all the assumptions of the model. It doesn't make the model invalid. It just means that the model is less valid than it could be. And of course, if you take a better thermometer, right? If you have a thermometer which measures on five degrees accurate, and of course changing your thermometer by one which is like accurate to two digits behind a comma will already improve this like third uh, assumption. Right? The less error, the better. Um, you can never avoid all errors together. But if we do the summary right, in R, then this is what R tells us. So the first thing that R does when you do the summary of the model, it gives you back the formula that you used, which is useful in some cases, because if you, if you build like six different models in R and you store them all in variables called A, B, C, D, E, which you should not do, right? Because you should do a model, you should give variables good names, but people generally don't. Um, it's good to be able to see which model you fit. So here you see some information about the residuals and you see that the residuals here are, like Alexander said, they're not actually zero, right? The median is slightly negative um, and you see that the, the minimum or the first quantile ranges from minus 17 to plus 11. So this cannot really be a good Gaussian model. Right, so I think Alexander is a little bit right that the um, that the residuals of the model are not a Gaussian distribution. 
but we can't really see this from the slide, but based on the numbers here, we can assume that hey, the mean is definitely not zero or the median is definitely not zero. It's slightly negative and it seems that the that the, the negative side of the normal distribution is way longer than the positive side because it, the first quantile is at minus 17 while the third quantile is at 11. So there's a, like a six point difference here. The thing which we want, what I want to show you guys is actually the estimates, right? Because the estimates are the beta estimates. So the, the estimates that we want to predict, right? So what do we learn? We learn that if the temperature would be zero, the ozone would have a value of minus 147, rounded, right? And then for every degree of temperature increase, the ozone seems to increase 2.4 points. And this is of course a little bit strange because that would mean that at a temperature of around like 20 degrees Celsius, you would still have kind of a, a negative ozone concentration, which is a little bit weird, but and this is just the data. It's just the regression model. Um, I don't actually know why it does that because it, it should not be because the ozone values are always positive, um, but it's just a bad model. That's the thing that we will conclude in the end, that this is not a very good model and that it's kind of overfitting at the at the lower end. Yeah, but this, these are the things that we learned. So the, the intercept is the location where uh, temperature is zero. So all the, all the independent variables are zero. And then this is what the prediction is for the ozone concentration. And then temperature itself gets a beta of 2.4. That means that every degree of temperature increase leads to around a two and a half point increase in the ozone concentration. And then here we see the multiple R squared. The multiple R squared is 0 0.48, which means that around 84% of the variance in the ozone concentration is determined by the temperature, which is relatively high. So it's not, a, it, the, the model explains a lot. It's just probably that the model isn't really valid. In R regression, you can do via the LM function. If you then want to show the results, you have to use the summary function. All right, so if we now want to plot this model, right, then we can do that very easily. Because R, when you do the plot, it allows you to just input more or less a linear model. Oh crap, someone's doing R on Twitch. It's not... <laughs> Maddie Tushus, thank you for subscribing. Um, it, why wouldn't you be doing R on Twitch, right? Like, it looks so beautiful. Like, let's open up the R window. Like, <gasps> it's R, it's R, as in awesome. Oh, okay, not oh crap. Like, no, I just got away from R and now I'm on Twitch and there's even more R. <laughs> Yeah, well, we've been doing this for quite some time. So this is actually lecture number nine. So there's eight more lectures on Twitch that you can look back and, and like learn all. <laughs> all right, so hey, in R, um, hey, we can use more or less the same way of writing down a formula to also make a plot, right? So if we want to make a plot, which has um, ozone as the dependent variable and then air or as ozone as the, I always mix them up. So this is the predict, this is the predictor and this is the response. Let's switch the terminology a little bit. Strange I hadn't found you yet, but I'm glad. Yeah, no, well, welcome to the to the lectures. Like, we're also on YouTube. <laughs> but uh, no, no, no. We're in season three already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We also did a bioinformatics course last winter semester. And this is the second time that I'm doing the art course on Twitch. So, uh, um, yeah, so we can use the plot function. We can just use more or less the same strategy as before. The only thing that is different from the model here, we see data is air quality. Um, but in the case of the plot, we cannot add data is. We just have to say, take from air quality, the column ozone, and then regress this, or, and regress this on the air quality data set, take the column temperature. I do PCA, it's 19 because I want to have like these filled dots, right? Because I don't like the open dots, which is the default for R. And then I say color is blue um, because I, I just like blue. So we make a blue plot. I missed everything. <laughs> no, you didn't miss anything. Like um, if you know what R is, then like you're already ahead. Um, okay, and now when I want to um, plot the regression line, also in R, it makes it very, very easy. So I can just say from lm.temp, right, which is my, my model that I built here. So from lm.temp, 
I take the coefficients and then I say take the intercept, right? So the intercept is my a coefficient, and I hope that everyone knows what the what the co what the formula is for a straight line in a plot. So straight line in a plot, I'm going to just write it down for you guys because, like, I know a lot of people don't do a lot of mathematics. So let me just do like. So a straight line in R, or a straight line in any mathematical formula, says that y, right, which is the y position of my point, is determined by something called a, right, so the intercept, so plus bx, right, so x here is my x coordinate, b is my, uh, is b is my directional coefficient, and a is my intercept. So if I want to uh, plot a straight uh, line, if I want to plot a straight line in R, I have to get the a coefficient, um, which is the uh, intercept. And then, of course, I also have to get the temperature coefficient, which is my b. So that is my how much do I increase with every increase from my air temperature. All right, and then I just say use the upline function, say a equals a, b equals b, color is red, line white is 2, and then it will plot the regression line in my plot. And here we can also see why now all of a sudden my like intercept becomes so massively negative is because at a temperature of around 60 degrees Fahrenheit um, there's almost no ozone in the air. But of course the linear model doesn't know that negative ozone concentrations cannot occur so it just extrapolates a straight line. And here you can directly see one of the drawbacks of, of modeling and linear modeling is that often your linear models, um, they, holy shit, no, I don't want to become famous. Block all these people. Help, where's my moderator? <laughs> no, don't become famous. I'm already famous enough. No. <laughs> anyway, and so here you can see the intercept is negative because just the linear model doesn't understand that negative, um, negative ozone values cannot occur. Right, there's also always some ozone. Chill, I'm on it. Yeah, thank you, thank you. You're the best moderator ever. Um, yeah, but just plotting the line, and, and this is generally what you want to do in uh, in a publication, right? Uh, of course, you want to make the plot look a little bit better. Hey, you might want to remove a couple of these outliers. Uh, you want to use ggplot or something like that. Um, but in the end, just Use the upline function, use the plot function, and you can make really nice plots. Um, and I like the fact that you can actually specify your, your dot plot very similar to the plots, um, or si very similar to the LM function. The only drawback is that you have to every time say air quality, dollar ozone, air quality, temperature. But of course, we've I've told you guys that if you use the with function, you can just say with air quality, plot ozone, um, squiggly line temperature and then of course you can do the same thing so and like in the plotting lecture we already showed you how you don't have to start or how you don't have to repeat air quality all over again all right so co co <laughs> confidence intervals right so if we look back to the model we see here that every estimate has a standard error right so because we are just doing an estimate of a certain relationship, we cannot be sure that the, the temperature exactly rises with 2.4287 points every temperature, right? Because sometimes it will be a little bit more, sometimes it will be a little bit less. Um, so every, uh, every variable or every predictor variable that you estimate comes with an error. So how do we do this? So when we calculate our confidence interval, right, where we where we have 95% of our data in, the first thing that we want to do is calculate the margin of error, right? So in standard regression, we can use the t statistic, right? So the the standard error from the LM summary we need, um, but that is given to us, and then we need to find the critical value, right? Because the critical value is the value at at, at is the value which we define because we want to have a 95% confidence interval or we want to have a 90% confidence interval or we want to have a 99% confidence interval. And just to give the researcher some wiggling room in 
to say how certain he wants to be. Right, so the first thing that we say is we want to define our critical value and generally in biology our critical value is 0.05, right? It's very similar to the alpha value. But in this case, since we are looking at confidence intervals, we have to do this two-sided. So because it is two-sided, we have to define our probability boundary as one minus alpha divided by two. So that means that in this case, our probability boundary for our 95% confidence interval is 0 0.975. I need to know how many degrees of freedom there are. Fortunately, the amount of degrees of freedom is also mentioned in the, um, well, not in the summary, but it's measured in the ANOVA test. Um, but we can get the number of degrees of freedom quite easily because it is the n value, so the number of measurements that we have, minus 2. Why minus 2? Well, we lose 1 degree of freedom for estimating the intercept, and we use 1 degree of freedom for estimating the temperature component, right? Because we're estimating two, um, two parameters, not just the beta for the temperature, but also the intercept. And then have, I can just use the QT function, so this is the, the T statistic function, and I can say, well, give me QT of 0 0.975 n minus 2, so this is the, uh, so the quantile T distribution we can use, and then we get our critical value. And now the margin of error at each point of the line is just calculated as the critical value times the standard error. This is really difficult, so I made a little example, um, but it's three, so I will take a very, very short break. I, I had some coffee somewhere, um, but uh, yeah, you guys take a break as well. Um, this week, break number one, the uh, animated GIFs I did not select. So the animated GIFs were selected by Daniel. I'm really happy that people actually are interested in the lecture and actually want to contribute, something like animated GIFs. Did you record it? Yeah, yeah, I'm recording. So um, everything, everything fine. Chill, I'm on it. Uh, anyway, so um, you guys can enjoy some animated GIFs for around five to 10 minutes. I will be back at 3.10 and then we will continue with an example of how to uh, calculate the co co confidence interval and how we can then make a nice plot. Hey, because of course in the regression, it just plotting the regression line is not enough. We want to have some nice confidence interval surrounding it to show people how good our model is. And of course, after that, we will start expanding our model and making it more and more complex. All right, so I will see you guys at 3.10 and enjoy the animated GIFs.